Um, thank you for uh, coming to this talk um, after lunch. Um, so Jason and I are going to be talking about honeypots uh, and uh, canary tokens, or honey tokens, um, and pretty much uh, it relates around to detecting security incidents and that sort of thing. Uh, we work at a company called Thinkst, um, and we have a background in security consulting, but uh, a couple of years ago we switched into making a security product. And this talk is around the uh, software that we, we use both uh, that we've released as open source. Uh, and so we're going to cover a few little bits um, in the talk. W we've been on this beat of uh, talking about honeypots and tokens uh, for a while now. So we've got a bunch of talks out on this uh, topic. And, and part of it is because we think the idea of honeypots has a lot of value. Um, and we really think that there's, uh, there's value there. Um, but this great idea over the years has been tarnished, frankly, by misapplied effort and direction. Um, and so there's three areas that I want to touch on in the talk. The first is uh, an open source project we run called Open Canary. The second one is another project we run called Canary Tokens. And then I want to end off with a discussion about how we as a, as a company um, leverage the open source projects that we run, but how we also have a commercial business and how we um, actually uh, make money uh, at the end of the day. So there's a lot of content. Um, we're going to dive right into this stuff. So let's start off with a question. Who has run a honeypot before? Any honeypot? Okay, there's a couple of hands. Do you still run them? You do run them. Do you, what's the reason for running them? Do you use them to monitor attacker behavior? Um, like, what's your... Could you detect someone in the environment? Okay. Do you detect someone in an environment? So that's a, that's a, a, a very valuable way, in our view, to use honeypots. There's a... There's an alternative view of honeypot um, deployment, which is uh, use honeypots to monitor attacker behaviors um, to basically gain insight into what attackers are doing. And that's slightly dated in our view. So I want to take a quick fly through some of the honeypot history to see how we got there. Um, and in dealing with honeypots, something that it's really uh, useful to think of as a defender, defenders often have this um, sort of siege mentality because they think that attackers have to only find one vulnerability in order to break into my network and I have to be, uh, I have to be strong across my entire perimeter or across all of my defenses. Um, but once an attacker has actually broken in and current security thinking is don't assume you will never be breached, it's assume you will be breached, how do you recover from that? Once an attacker is inside of your network, they are now uh, in an uncomfortable and unfamiliar place, and they're on your home territory. So an attacker who's inside your network just needs to be detected once. They just have to make one mistake um, in order to be detected. So that's, that asymmetry flips. And honeypots are one way that you can really uh, sort of leverage that uh, asymmetry. So for defenders, you want to make your territory as inhospitable to attackers as possible. And you can do that through both uh, honeypots and through tokens, as we're going to see. Um, has anyone read uh, The Cuckoo's Egg? Like, so certainly, uh, that's a, a bit of a classic. Um, Cliff Stoll, basically in 89, published this book on how they tracked uh, a particular hacker running through American uh, education and uh, military networks. Um, and in that, he basically comes up with the uh, idea of a honeypot sort of as they're trying to find out where this, this attack is coming from. Um, and in 91, Bill Cheswick uh, released a paper called An Evening with Burford, in which he talks about an SMTP honeypot. So that was already 89, 91. Um, in the super early 2000s, uh, there was a small mailing list which was discussing this sort of idea. They eventually renamed themselves the Honeypot, the, sorry, the HoneyNet project. Um, and at the time, their focus was on running honeypots to monitor attacker behavior, get a sense of the tools, the tactics, motivations, that sort of thing, and then publishing that stuff through a series of papers called Know Your Enemy. And that view of the honeypot being a research tool uh, has been quite dominant going forward. And so on that, there's a honeypot mailing list that was very uh, active in the early 2000s, um, but you can see interest completely waned, and in 2013, uh, it died. But it's not to say that interest in, in honeypots has waned. So we run a site called uh, ConCollector, and w basically there what we try to do is to track uh, information security talks. We try to pr provide like a public bi uh, bibliography for uh, security talks. And what you can see is that um, interest hasn't waned in honeypots, in, in people talking about honeypots at conferences. And that number has actually started to climb significantly 
uh, since sort of 2013. And 2014 is when we also started to get involved in the space. And at that time, we did a significant talk for us where basically we laid out a whole bunch of arguments for and against uh, honeypots in particular. Um, and the summary of that talk is that, again, it's a great idea. It's got merit for defenders. Um, but the tooling hasn't been up to scratch for honeypots. And so what it means is that often honeypots get, or those sorts of honeypots at the time, were being deployed by tinkerers. People had time on their hands. They were playing. They wanted to see how it worked. But the tooling wasn't sufficient such that um, if you were in an enterprise, you could take honeypot, honeypots, deploy them, and get um, and sort of start to leverage that asymmetry. So we built Open Canary, which we released in 2014. Um, and the focus for us was on having an easy to deploy honeypot. Um, we have some principles around it, which I'll talk, one of which is that we see it as a sensor. I mean, this is a, uh, this is a project that is ongoing for us. Um, it's, the documentation is, like many open source projects, uh, dubious, um, but, uh, but recently in Linux format, um, there was a, a tutorial that got published. So there's, um, there's some documentation around that. But, you know, there's a lot of source code. And in building Open Canary, we sort of came up with a couple of principles that we wanted to follow through for, through on, rather. And primary, or primarily amongst those, were the fact that we weren't trying to monitor attacker behavior. We weren't trying to understand or research attackers. What we want to do is detect breaches. So Open Canary runs inside of networks, exposing it to the open internet. You're just going to get a lot of wasted events. That's not where we see it. We see it as inside your network. It should only alert you when actual bad stuff is happening. It's a sensor, so it's only going to be sending events. Uh, it doesn't actually do a lot of uh, smart things inside of Open Canary itself. It'll ship you events via a bunch of different channels. Um, so it's not going to coalesce and do that sort of thing. Um, we also wanted it to be as extensible as possible. And Jason's going to show us a few examples of that. So it's easy to write modules or even uh, fake out services without writing any code. And then lastly, uh, it should completely limit your exposure. So there's no point in you, in you running a, a project, say, like HoneyD, which is written in C, and then if there are any vulnerabilities in HoneyD because it's uh, written in C, um, you leave yourself in a worse place. So to that end, um, the way that we designed Open Canary, so it's Python-based, we used Twisted. Um, so a whole class of memory corruption vulnerabilities just reduced to memory corruption in the Python interpreter. Um, so it's not our problem anymore. Um, and then as I said, in terms of it being a sensor, we can send you the data via email or JSON over TCP or syslog or HP feeds, there's a few. You can actually just use straight Python login as well if you want. Um, and then to make it extensible, uh, we reduce everything to individual modules. So protocol gets its own file, its own Python module. Um, and then we sort of extract and factor out all of the the logging and the other framework stuff, and so actually to implement a single module becomes quite simple. So we're going to step through a quick demo. Uh, Jay's going to walk us through the installation, and then he's going to show us an alert in Open Canary. Ah, thanks, Mark. So for our first demo, we're just quickly going to show how easy it is to set up. Um, we believe that friction to deploy or manage honeypots are barriers, and, and so we um, make sure that it's quite quick and easy to do. Um, Make sure this is all going across there. So what we'll first do is we'll quickly create our config. Um, and then we can actually quickly go into it and check it out. Three or less. Oh, nearly. Okay. And in here you'll see we've got a whole bunch of services. It's in JSON, so it's quite easy to understand. Um, we'll go take a look quickly that we've got our logger. And basically, it allows you to put any sort of Python native logging you can um, supply here. We're going to do uh, some JSON over TCP. Um, and then one of the services we're going to look at is SSH, since everyone knows SSH. So you can see we've enabled it, um, port 22, which is the usual port, and we've set a banner for it. Um, so let's go see how this looks. Um, we'll first quickly just start ourselves a logger. Uh, listening for that one, and then we can actually start the open canary over here. So once we've started it, we can quickly go check our logging. It'll tell us now that it's added a service. Uh, we can check which service it is. It's the canary SSH, and it tells us that it's running. So that's great. 
can also quickly check by using netstat. And we can check that port 22, something's running on port 22, it's Python. Uh, we now open Canary's done in Python. So that's basically your setup, which is actually quite quick and easy. The next one we're going to do is try and trigger an alert. So we'll move over to um, connect. We'll move over to our attacker terminal. We'll try connect to this SSH service um, that we just started. What we expect is an interaction that mimics that of a normal SSH as far as authentication. At which point we'll get alerted, and someone, uh, well, that someone's trying to get in. And as the attacker, we're just going to constantly get denied access. Um, before we SSH in, we're also just going to quickly check the um, banner that we set is coming through. So if we head over to our attacker one, we can quickly just netcat to it um, 22, and we see there's our banner coming through. If we decide we want to SSH, that's Alice, and we see it's the usual interaction. We can put in some passwords, um, and we're going to get denied a couple times. After three, it's going to kick us out like a usual um, SSH server would. If we go to our login quickly, we can take a look. We get a connect. We get our passwords here that I put in. Hello, ASD. Um, we get a bit of a source IP and stuff like that as well, which is great. So as you've seen, the Open Canary services are made to look realistic and will alert you uh, when the service is being abused. We have multiple services, which allows you to create personalities, um, such as a NAS device. Uh, these are currently the services that we support today. There's a mixture of TCP and UDP services in there, and the implementations carry the protocol as far as needed to get a reliable indicator of badness. For example, you saw that we don't le let you log into the SSH server. We always deny authentication. The act of trying to SSH into the machine um, already will trigger alert and then therefore an investigation. Open Canary also allows you to integrate with external programs um, to extend protocol coverage. You can tie Open Canary into Samba and have a Windows file share that tells you when people are opening files. You can also use Open Canary to work with IP tables to tell you when your honeypot is being port scanned. Since we wanted this to be extensible, uh, you just need modules to implement their protocol specific bits. So the Open Canary framework takes care of alerting and formatting and the rest of it. Here we have an example of our NTP module, which as you can see is 27 lines, and actually the guts of it is just five lines. Um, we'll also be releasing some new modules today. Um, we're going to release a Git module, which speaks the Git protocol, and will report any attempts to clone repos. We're also releasing a Redis module so that your Open Canary can look like a full-fledged Redis server. We're going to release a few more port scan detections, um, the Nmap OS, null scan, Xmas scans. And lastly, we're going to release the TCP banner support. So since we really want Open Canary to become extensible, the framework allows you already to make modules quite easily, but in many cases you want something even simpler, um, so basically no need for coding. This TCP banner service um, is that dead simple service. You tell it what to send when the connection occurs, and that's pretty much it. No state machines or anything else, but you'll quickly um, pick up attackers looking for specific services. Uh, for example, here's the config of the TCP banner. Uh, this declarative form defines a fake SMTP server on uh, port 25. On the initial connection, we'll send a 220 banner, and on all subsequent data received, we'll send a 530 authentication required error. Um, so let's head over to that and take a look. So if we quickly go and change our config, we can head over to TCP banner. Oh, let's go with uh, TCP banner. So you'll see here we've got all our TCP banner service stuff, uh, the configurations. If we go here, we can quickly make this true. And the top one here, make that true. So now we've set it to true. We're going to then restart the service. But we can also quickly just take a look at what are the other options. We also allow a keep alive option. So you can leave a connection open for ages. And that will also lure people to come and see what's actually happening there. Uh, we can save that, and we restart it. So once we've restarted, we can quickly just check that it has restarted. Once again, we've added the SSH because we didn't disable it, and we've got the TCP banner service enabled over here. If we head over to our attacker, and we try netcat to that, <coughs> 25, 
we see we get that uh, initial banner connection. From there, we can try something like, um, hello, Saka, and we're going to start getting. So every time you send data through now, we're going to keep getting this banner replied. If we go over to our logger, we'll see the information. We're getting a data received event, and you can find the info in there. There's the data there or over there, hello, Taka. So as you can see, it's very easy to set up. So without writing any code, you can start to design and customize your own services and interactions because we understand that there's really not a one-size-fits-all in security. To recap, the TCP banner allows a service to be run on any port and to interact with, any, oh well, with different information on connect and data received. So it will still alert you when someone's trying to interact with it, and it can all be configured in that nice, easy JSON file. Um, so as you can see, the Open Canary is a bit of a twist on uh, the conventional thinking behind honeypots. This view of honeypots doesn't mind if attacker realizes that this honeypot is fake, so long as they've revealed themselves in the process. It's different from the more dominant view of honeypots as a research tool for monitoring attacker behavior. As a reminder, Open Canary is intended to be installed um, inside your network. Having an internet exposed honeypot is just an endless stream of useless events. Uh, so you can go and find it at opencanary.org. We've also got a GitHub where all the source code, or you can do it through PyPy. Thanks, Jay. Um, so we've got Open Canary as this, uh, this software package that we release, that we support, um, and it provides very much a traditional honeypot in the, in the sense that it gives you fake uh, services or simulated services, and it tells you when people uh, try and interact with them. Um, but these honeypots get deployed alongside your production infrastructure, and they're not uh, deployed on your production infrastructure in most, uh, in most cases. You're not going to run uh, a honeypot on the same server as your production web servers, generally. Um, and so people who are looking for other kinds of detection, um, when, you, when you actually want to put detection on, onto, the, uh, onto the servers and endpoints where production data and services sit, usually you've got one of two options, and those options tend to fall between agents or scanners. So either you have to deploy an agent on every machine that is doing local file checks and the rest of that stuff, or you've got some central scanner that goes across the network and it, uh, it does audits on the machines. Um, but both of them have cons, right? So the agents are additional resources on every machine um, are consumed. And on the sort of central scanner side, it means that you've got one machine which can log into all the machines in your environment, which makes that one a very interesting target for an attacker. Um, and so there is a third way, um, and so now we're going to be stepping away from Open Canary. So Open Canary, honeypot thing, uh, you deploy it on um, its, own, uh, its own base. We're now going to move towards something which is this third way. Um, and this is, these are the two diverging uh, deception designs. And this thing that we're talking about is also fairly old. So some of the initial ideas behind this go back a century. Um, and certainly in information security, they go back to the early uh, 2000s. So in 2015, we had another look at this, and we're going to talk about what it is. We released this thing called Canary Tokens. And so I want to talk a little bit about Canary Tokens through a related example. Um, and the, that example is the idea of a copyright trap. And you probably have encountered this at some point. The basic idea is that map makers, for example, will often embed fake data or false data inside of the maps that they produce, so that if uh, a competitor copies the map, then they know that that map has been copied. The same with things like phone directories, that sort of information. So you embed fake information inside real information, and then um, when that information gets pops up in another place, if you see the fake information there, you know uh, that uh, copying has happened. Um, and so the town of Aglo in New York is exactly that. It was a town that the Esso company stuck into one of their maps uh, a long time ago, and uh, that map popped up in one of their competitors, that town rather popped up in one of their competitors' maps, uh, which fostered a lawsuit. Um, and so in the early 2000s, again, the folks at the HoneyNet project who did most of the leading work in the space at that time, they came up with this idea for uh, honey tokens. And the way that a honey token would work is, let's say you've got a card data table uh, in your database, um, what you would do is you would insert fake rows into the database, right? So out of all of these rows, that one is the one which is fake. Um, but just having a fake row in the database is not sufficient. You need something or somewhere to tell you that that fake row is moving around the network. And if we go back to 
the early 2000s when this came out and sort of a three-tier architecture was quite standard, um, you could stick a monitor between the database and your web server and monitor all the traffic going across the wire for that fake credit card number, for example. And if you ever see that in the traffic, then you know someone's querying the database and they're querying rows that they shouldn't be querying. Let's go investigate what that is. But the idea never caught on in a big way. And part of what makes this, this particular design tricky is because you now have to also manage this monitor. And this monitor at the time would have been annoying because it means all your traffic goes through this one machine. It's a single point of failure. Um, or you have to put a monitor on all of your pods. And this was in the early 2000s. Nowadays, the idea that you've got uh, sort of single pods between or even just single databases or single uh, web servers is kind of a relic. Um, and so that idea of honey tokens didn't really catch on. Um, also, super early, and this goes back to 1998, uh, there was a Russian espionage operation called Moonlight Maze in which the Russians were stealing American secrets. Um, and the way that the Americans uh, figured out where the attackers were coming from is they basically left a Word document around with a beacon inside. When the Word document was stolen, it got opened up in Russia, um, the Word document beaconed out, and that helped them figure out where they were getting attacked from. So it's taking that idea, that very core cool idea. Um, so what we want to do is to try and get detection capabilities, but without honeypots, without network monitoring, without any endpoints, or any agents, rather. Um, and we think it is possible to detect, detect badness without those tools. Um, and so we built this thing called Canary Tokens, um, and it's basically our take on, on the Honey Tokens idea. Um, but it's a full implementation, and there's a bunch of new ideas in there. And core for us is the idea that it should be easy for you to use. So with the old Honey Tokens idea, you had to somehow deploy a monitor in the middle of your network streams and then manually embed data in your database. Nobody got time for that. Um, it should be as easy to use as possible. And so what we do with Canary Tokens is we look for those places, and those places are virtual places. They could be files. They could be uh, just data. They could be um, digital locations of some kind, where it's possible to trigger requests. And a, a request here is either an HTTP lookup or a request is a DNS lookup. And to give you one example, um, if you run on Windows, if you run a signed binary, so you can sign binaries in the Microsoft world, um, binaries get signed with a certificate. That certificate has a revocation URL embedded in the certificate, right? And when you run the binary, you can force Windows to request that URL because it wants to see if the certificate is still valid, right? And so now if you make the URL that is inside of the certificate a unique URL that points back at your own server, every time someone runs the binary, your URL gets pinged. You know someone's run the binary, right? So there's, a, and that sort of thinking, there's a whole bunch of those. So the Word document is an obvious one. Someone opens a Word document, you can embed an image in there which points to a URL, uh, PDF, there's a, we've got a nice trick with PDFs um, that'll give you an alert if they're opened, even if you click cancel and the little dialog that pops up, like at that point the, the alert's already gone out. Um, you could, for example, uh, with Canary Token specifically, you can um, put a little bit of Bitcoin in a wallet, leave it on a server, and have Canary Tokens monitor that wallet. So if someone breaks into a server, they find the Bitcoin wallet, they steal the funds, the Canary Token server can monitor the wallet, tell you when the funds have been uh, removed, and that way you know that the server's been hacked. So it's that kind of thinking. You're looking for places where you can embed a little bit of unique information that at the end of the day will cause a URL or a, a host name to be looked up. Um, and so we manage with Canary Tokens all the infrastructure around uh, generating the tokens plus giving you the alert. And um, we're going to look at a couple of these examples now. Um, but this is, this is also an open source project uh, which we run, um, and Jay's going to give us a bit more insight into um, how that works. Oh, thanks. Um, so the first uh, of the simple channels that we actually use for these Canary tokens is the HTTP channel. Um, it's the simplest token because basically it's a unique URL. You hit it and we get an alert. Uh, we also have basically a simple action, a response, and we, you'll see we actually build it into something quite powerful later on. We also prefer the HTTP uh, channel just because of the information we can gain from it. Um, but we'll discuss that in a little bit. So we're quickly going to head over to 
Canary Tokens. So this is the service we run. It's completely free. Anyone can go there, canarytokens.org, um, and you can create your tokens. As you can see, we've got a bunch, um, some more fun than useful, but the other lot are actually really useful. Um, this one, we'll just quickly have to put in some information where you'll get an email, so an alert for us, and then we give it a reminder so you know where you place this when it actually gets hit. We scroll down to create. Technical difficulty. Um, let me try again. Is this um, is the network up? I think so. It was up. <laughs> um, okay, so we're not getting a great. Um, so it was working earlier. Um, I'm not sure why it's. Yeah. Yeah. So reconnect the Wi-Fi. Quickly try that. Then we'll come back on again. Um, so while Jay does that, just the uh, um, there is a whole long list of those canary tokens on the site. Um, but as he's as he's going to say, um, they are all built off those two building blocks, which are uh, either URL requests or DNS host names. And it really is kind of amazing what files or what locations will uh, trigger URLs or uh, trigger host names. Um, and we've been building on Canary tokens for uh, for quite a while. Um, and so this is the uh, this is the totality of that. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so we back up. Yay. Uh, we'll quickly put in this again and then we can continue. Hopefully a little bit more luck this time. Great. Yay. Okay, so you see here we've got our unique URL that we were speaking about. Um, and the idea, as Mark said, is just to put it somewhere where it's almost just too juicy for someone to click on. So something like your Slack history, put it there with some messages about, hey, uh, we've moved the documents here or passwords or auth tokens, whatever you would like. Basically what happens is the attacker reads this message or someone that's snooping in your Slack history and they can't help but have to browse to it. So I'll browse to it now just to see if we can get it going. Um, and basically what we'll end up seeing is we get an email that comes through. And this will be your alert email. So it'll tell you which channel it was, it'll give you the reminder that we wrote in earlier, and it also gives you the source IP, user agent information. Um, and then we've also got a little bit more of a management place for it. So if we click over here, we jump through to this um, incident list that we have for this token. So anytime anyone hits this token now, boom, you've got your ho whole management section here. We've got a little bit of GRIP that we do on the source IP. So it'll give you the location, um, host name, stuff like that. Um, and then we try to pull as much as we can from the person's browser as well. So we get some JavaScript information here. So you can try, when you uh, start your investigation, at least you know a little bit more. So that is our HTTP token. These are great in normal networks since most people um, allow HTTP traffic. But we all know that some networks can be restricted, and so sometimes you have no, uh, firewalls or some sort of intermediary device that will restrict this kind of traffic. Hence, we have our DNS token. The DNS token is a bit more of a reliable signal, um, and it is triggered whenever a host name is looked up. The, uh, the most, oh, so most networks w won't restrict um, DNS queries because you would need to resolve host names unless you're just working in with um, like IP addresses, which is very unlikely. Unfortunately, as you will see with DNS tokens, um, we get a lot less information because the IP or the source IP that we actually get is of the DNS server. So here, the, DN the actual token is a unique um, host name. When it's resolved, it triggers an alert. So we can quickly see that in action. If we head back to here, we go choose DNS token, we give it a the email again. Um, and we give it a nice memo for us to remember it by. Create this token. So you'll see there now we've got our unique host name. And the idea with these ones is when it's happened, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, so when it's happened, 
you panic a little bit because you've put it somewhere very sensitive. So you put it in config files on servers that no one should be ever looking at. And basically what happens is when you resolve it, if we head back to our attacker and we use host to resolve this, <coughs> we should get an alert if this resolves. Great. Okay, let's just wait. There we go. So we see here our mail comes through. We've got our reminder that we set, token type, and you see our source IP has suddenly changed. And if we head over to that same console that we did earlier, uh, for now for this new one, we'll see it's actually, oh, okay, that's interesting. So it's saying that the DNS that we're getting from is in uh, Brussels, which is kind of cool. Um, and you'll see we don't have that JavaScript section um, with all that in extra information anymore. But at least you know now that that server's been breached. Um, so then we've now uh, introduced the two building box um, for more complex tokens. We've got our HTTP and we've got our DNS channels. As we've said, DNS is useful since you don't need a direct connection and there's lots of places where you can get a DNS query out um, where HTTP would fail. Um, it's important also to note that DNS does mean you lose that source IP, whereas HTTP gives you source IP, you'll lose out on a more restricted network. Um, here's the whole list of the tokens that you can generate today, all of which use either the web or the DNS channels. Um, so we're just going to have a quick look at some of the two more complicated ones. The first one is for source code and uh, specifically source code repos. It's our SVN token. Most organizations have them and they contain source code from current projects as well as old and completed projects. Since um, access to these repos is limited, um, it's sometimes also not governed very well. So someone gets credentials that they shouldn't have and they can pull the sensitive code. Um, we'll then be alerted on this pool, which makes it very useful, so you can stop the leaking, um, or more leaking of that code. Subversion has this idea of externals definitions, which simply allows you to uh, map local directories to a URL of a versioned um, directory. So this lets you include a remote repo in your SVN repos. Using this idea, we simply replace the externals URL with a token URL, um, and when the repo is pulled, the token is hit, and you get a, an alert. Here we quickly have some demo, um, some diagrams just showing it. So we have our repo there. We, in, we include our SVN canary token. So we create the external property in the repo pointing to canarytokens.org or .com. An attacker discovers this repo and checks out our repo. When they check it out, the external URL is requested. Um, because the URL is unique um, and only deployed in our repo, we know it gets checked out. Um, at this point, Canary Token sends you an email saying that your token has been triggered. And since you've only put this in your one repo, you know that which repo it is and you can go and investigate. Our final token is the um, AWS API key token. Um, if you're not familiar with AWS, their APIs are accessed through a key and a secret, and it's often stored in files and servers or developer machines. So keys have different kinds of permissions. Um, which is important to know, um, and then attackers love AWS credentials. API keys could mean uh, the access to an entire organization's computing infrastructure and their data, so attackers will always try them when they see them. We can leverage this by creating valid, um, completely valid credentials without any permissions, and then we just monitor their usage. Um, so this is quickly how you would do it. You head over to the canarytokens.org, you choose AWS keys, you input the details, so the memo, where you want to get emailed, um, we then create these legitimate AWS creds to you, and you now go and place them on one of your servers. If that machine ever gets breached, the attacker will go looking for AWS creds, and they find your tokened ones. They attempt to use these tokened ones, and in this example, we have an attacker that tries um, to query, say, the EC2 API, which responds with an unauthorized operation. The attacker sees a failure, but you get an email saying that these creds were used, and from this, you know that your server has been breached. Um, so you can see um, that the user experience, there's, a, there's simplicity and a lot of usefulness in having this kind of token, like the AWS one. Um, but uh, do, how does it technically work? Um, it's a bit of a Rube Goldberg machine, leveraging a bunch of AWS components. Um, AWS API um, gateway basically generates entries in CloudTrail, which can then trigger events in CloudWatch which can then fire lambdas, and then your lambda triggers your canary token, which in turn then sends you an email. So that's our canary tokens. Um, you can go and generate as many as you like, and it's available on GitHub as well. Thank you. Oh, yeah, cool.
Okay, so um, Canary Tokens is also a, uh, it's also an open source project, so, and there's two parts to it. So we run that reference site, canarytokens.org. We also publish uh, the source for it. Um, and so in terms of the people who make use of the free one, um, like we've got some solid uh, examples of it working for people. So this might have flown under uh, the radar, but a couple of months back, it turned out that Chrome was scanning uh, files on your machine for malware. Um, and that uh, Kelly Shortridge, who's a, an InfoSec uh, Twitter person, uh, she figured this out um, through a Canary token. Um, so this is just one uh, story from uh, someone who uses it. But basically this, this uh, canarytokens.org user, uh, they had a web server which they deployed a, a token Word document onto. Two months after they put the document on the server, they decommissioned it, so it was offline, uh, no longer there. Um, and then a month after that, the document was open from somewhere in Russia. Um, and so basically in that two month period, um, they had been breached, stuff had been taken, they had no idea that it had happened and the token was the, the thing that um, told them that that was the case. So we really want people to use this stuff and if you looked at our reference site, um, you would have seen, well, the tokens you generate there are in canarytokens.com, I can just monitor for that domain, black hole it, whatever the case is, which is totally the case. Um, uh, so we there's about 120,000 tokens at the moment which run on the reference site. Um, but we make Docker images available, so it's trivial, really is trivial for you to bring up your own Canary Token site. Like, buy a domain for $10 or $8 or whatever it is, um, and then deploy the tokens Docker, and you have your own Canary Token site that no one else uh, knows about. Um, and so, um, I want to sort of shift the, the discussion just a little right here at the end to, um, you know, we give away open Canary, well, we maintain open Canary and Canary Tokens, and these are really a large part of what we do commercially as well. Um, and so we give away core, the core of our software, really, but we want people to use the free stuff. We're not giving away the free stuff to try and drive people to uh, the commercial stuff. And for example, you know, it would be easy to put out a container but not source um, in order to get people onto the commercial stuff, but that would kind of make it crippleware, um, and that's not what we want to do. So as I said, I want to do this quick interlude between how, as a company, we sort of merge both open source software um, and the stuff that we do uh, that keeps the lights on. So Open Canary and Canary Tokens, they're both licensed really liberally, BSD and GPL3 respectively. Um, but we do have this commercial side, which is Canary. Um, and in truth, the features flow backwards and forwards between both the open source and the commercial stuff. And so if I make a really terrible Venn diagram, um, what you've got here is basically you've got Open Canary and Canary Tokens. You can see that the commercial service basically includes everything, except for a little bit of Open Canary, which isn't in the commercial service. Um, and the bits that aren't in the open source uh, code are, there's basically two, uh, two boundaries. The one is stuff around management, um, alerting, and configuration. The commercial stuff makes that a lot easier. Um, and the second one is that the, uh, in the commercial version, you also get a console to manage the things. And pretty much anything on the console side um, doesn't make it uh, across. Um, but when it comes to features inside of Open Canary, they go across to the commercial, and as we're showing today with Git, Redis, uh, t uh, TCP banners, and IP tables, we move stuff from the commercial one into uh, the open source one as well. Um, and so it seems like, or you might think that um, publishing open source software means you lose out on potential customers. And we have seen some examples of that where um, we had a chat with uh, some folks from one of the Silicon Valley unicorns earlier this year. It turns out they deploy Open Canary inside their networks. They can totally afford the commercial one, um, but they don't take the commercial one. Uh, but we don't sl lose sleep over that thing. So um, for folks who can actually manage or run their own honeypots, maybe we're not the, the commercial side is not the one for them. Um, we're really trying to just make it pain-free. If they've got a whole team who can manage honeypots, um, Open Canary seems like it works. So knowing your target audience is just basic product advice. Um, but it doesn't mean that we'd put out a subpar open source project. So we don't, as I said, we don't put out this open source trying to get people to upgrade. Um, both Open Canary and Canary Tokens are functional, um, highly functional uh, by themselves. And it's not actually a big driver of customers for us. So we don't see a big uptake for people who use the open source stuff coming through to commercial. But we support them because we think the stuff is uh, genuinely useful. Um, and I in truth, both Open Canary and Canary Tokens get attention because of the success of the commercial stuff. So we get to spend company time on those open source projects. Um, 
But putting out code is just one thing. Also running a reference site is a service, and that's a whole different kind of kettle of fish. Um, and so sometimes we're providing non-free service. Uh, sorry, we're providing a free, su a free support on the non-commercial stuff. And it's a fine line. You can't run a company on free, um, but again, we, we're kind of committed to this. We didn't get too involved in the license discussion. Not a thing for me. Um, we've got a mixture of BSD and GPL. Um, other people can take your code, do stuff with it. We've seen that. There's other companies who've taken Canary Tokens code. They're running their own. They make terrible logos, <laughs> horrible <laughs> logos. So that is not our logo. Um, if you ever see that, it's terrible. Um, but they're spreading the message. And that message means that uh, we're having success. We can support other projects. So we can support, uh, we sponsor Twisted, uh, Django Girls, Women in Tech, um, Homebrew. Um, and that's all on the back of Commercial Canary um, keeping those other open source projects going. And so then the last thing here is it's also given us sort of a view from the other side, which is maintaining and running a project. Um, and sometimes you encounter folks who expect you to jump for them on a free service and it's like open source code. Um, so you'll get people who uh, they want to fork the code before they've even submitted PRs for issues, which so pretty much there, don't be that guy. Like be nicer than that. Um, we, we'll send you t-shirts if you send us a PR. So to wrap up, we spoke Open Canary, Trivial Honeypots, uh, Canary Tokens, Agentless Detection, uh, and then I talked to you a little bit about some of the commercial stuff. And uh, that's us. Thank you very much.